<coughs> Oj, ursäkta mig. Eh, välkomna tillbaka efter lunch. Eh, nu blir det programpunkt på engelska igen. So, if anyone was looking forward to some more easy casual entertainment on the third day of the autumn meeting after, just after lunch, you will be disappointed. We get back into the cave of cultural heritage. And uh, now we are going to deal with cultural heritage and the sense of belonging and also how we connect that to physical objects. And we will do that through a uh, discussion. And you will welcome on stage. Uh, welcome Hans Ruin, uh, professor in philosophy at Södertörn University, recently led the multidisciplinary research program, Time, Memory and Representation. Thank you. And we have Lotten Gustafsson Reinius, visiting professor at the Nordic Museum and University of Stockholm. And we have yeah. Tiffany Jenkins, now well known, <laughs> who we met <laughs> yesterday, Finally. and the author of the recently published Keeping the Marbles. I'm handing over to you, Hans, to guide us through this discussion and these presentations. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, the re-invitation. I'm happy to be back from, from last year. Um, so much is happening in our relation to history and tradition and heritage, and um, we heard some examples of that yesterday from Tiffany, whose talk I heard on the web, actually, because I wasn't here. But, um, and um, uh, memorials are being uh, torn down, new memorials are being built, uh, museums are opening all the time, uh, cultural institutions are being reinvented and contested, and uh, it's as if the whole space of historical culture is undergoing a turmoil and renegotiation. Um, this situation, which uh, of course has a certain date, I mean we could date it to the year of 1989 with the transformation mm -hmm. of Europe, but also the final collapse of, of the colonial system with the uh, change of regime in South Africa, with all the discussions about history and the transitional justice. All of these questions uh, motivated a group of researchers from very many different disciplines uh, some six, seven years ago to unite and try to explore this territory together. And um, this project that we call Time, Memory and Representation, I think we had 13 or 14 different disciplines, all from philosophy to political science to theology, uh, the various cultural disciplines, art, literature, intellectual history, etc., uh, archaeology not least. And uh, to work together to try, try somehow to develop a language and a map of this new territory. And uh, one uh, of the results, the most substantial result in Swedish, is the book that I brought with me to show you because I'm so proud of its simple magnitude and weight. It weighs 3.4 kilos. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it came just a few weeks ago at Macadam's Verlag. And um, this book, which is a, a collection of articles, not only by ourselves, but also by invited researchers in the whole Nordic space, um, uh, we baptized it Historians Hemvist, uh, a concept which does not even have a clear English translation. Right. Um, it's the, uh, but um, you could speak of it as belonging, but also the dominion, and maybe the place from where you come. We also think of it a little bit as the ethos of history, actually, because it has an ethical implication. When we discussed this panel, uh, I managed to inspire the organizers with this concept because they said, oh, it's an interesting concept. So let's think about this in terms, hem, vist in terms of belonging. So, um, uh, and the, and the, we, when we have a short introduction to this volume where we point to the fact that this has an interesting ambiguity, this hem, vist, because you can look upon it as, does history have a hemvist, a belonging? And in that sense, you're asking, where do we find history? Where is it located? In one sense, it doesn't exist, right? It's past, it's nothing. <laughs> but when you begin to look at it, it's located in many different places. It's located in these chipped walls, it's located in the archives, maybe it's located also in our own practices, and suddenly you see history somehow inhabiting the present. <laughs> 
the other aspect of historians' hand which also has been interesting for us to explore, is how we, as human beings, also, in a sense, take our place and begin to live in history and through history. So history is a space in which we experience belonging. And this predicament is, of course, something that has become even more important today with the world of, of increasing refugees and exiles. Can you be, so to say, exiled in your physical body, but still belong to your history? And inversely, can you be torn away from your history and move to a different space, but can you then belong to that space if you, if you have lost your history? So I think these are issues that have now become important. But today in this panel, we're going to discuss this more in, in specific in terms of objects and questions that were also raised yesterday in your talk about the belonging of artifacts mm -hmm. and what these questions address to us. So with these introductory words, I give the word to Lotten, and then Tiffany will give an introduction, and then I will come back and tell you a little narrative, and then we take the discussion from there. Please. Huh. A narrative <laughs> is awaiting us <laughs> on the other side of these two introductions. <laughs> That's always good to know. Uh, well, thank you for in inviting me to this wonderful place. It makes you feel a little as a rock star. Uh, and, and also, of course, I'm, I'm thrilled for the opportunity to discuss some of my favorite topics with interesting people. Uh, and, well, there we are. It's uh, the issues of uh, the role of materiality for memory making and also uh, on memorials and, uh, and how, they are, how they are negotiated and uh, the roles they play in contemporary society and in creating relations and changing categories in different processes of negotiation, but also in physical movements. So this was a lot of thoughts here, but I, I, I sometimes uh, use a concept, I think of it as the socio-material dynamics. They are not only social, they are not only material, they are not only stable, but they are also constantly in process. And I wanted to give you a few examples uh, uh, using uh, physical monuments and memorials of different kinds, and also in situations of uh, maybe contested heritages. Uh, myself, I, maybe I should position myself a little, because I, I, it's sometimes difficult. At present, I'm a visiting professor at Stockholm University and the Nordic Museum. One, one leg in each, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, have, I have been like this constantly in my professional career, uh, working as curator and as researcher, and, uh, and often I've started to think of this as not, you know, as, as a totally intertwined uh, activity. I, I, I think you need to move between exploration and trial and dialogue, and back to reflection and solitude and text writing and then out again and uh, using words and objects as the tools, a kind of museology from within. Uh, the project at the Nordic Museum deals with man in the Arctic in the light of climate change. So my first pictures are from Nuuk, the harbor of Nuuk on Greenland that I visited for the first time this fall. And, uh, of course, Greenland is a place in itself that is very good to exemplify how places can be uh, recharged in very dramatic ways. A place that has been seen, seen as an isolated periphery of Europe, characterized by a threatening nature, but also by an extreme stability, this frozen, huge glaciers that keep everything in, in space, so to say, a place where time almost uh, stops existing, and today it's of course the opposite. It's at the center of our attention, of our concerns. We associate it with rapid changes, with time that is running in a dangerous, fierce, fierce manner. And uh, there, in the harbor, we find these two monuments. I thought it was an interesting example of an interplay of conscious memorial making. Uh, it's the statue of uh, Hans Egede, a Norwegian-Danish missionary, uh, sometimes called the Apostle of Greenland. Uh, he came to Greenland because he, he was really concerned that the Nordic people living there, they were Christians, for all he knew, but they weren't aware that 
they were also Lutherans belonging to the Nordic countries and the Danish king. And he went there and he found out that both Christianity and the Norse were actually extinct by the time. Instead, he found the Tule people, an indigenous population that had migrated in later than the Norse, but having a lot of uh, cultural traits in common with older uh, Inuit cultures. This is the story of Greenland. It's waves, migration waves, and heritage is on, lay on top of each other. And uh, so he became, uh, he sort of became the apostle, although Christianity had been there for 300 years and disappeared. Uh, the statue was erected in 1909, maybe also because it was a good, important uh, for Denmark to, to make a statement. This is the founder of Nuuk, it's the founder of Christianity, and you find a similar statue in Copenhagen. Uh, he's famous also for uh, the way he translated uh, the prayer of the Lord uh, to the locals. Instead of saying, give us our daily bread, he said, provide us, please, Lord. Uh, our daily seal in the harbor. Mm -hmm. And people like this, <laughs> so, it makes sense. And so what, they, what, what happened in 2007, I think, is that they put the seals in the harbor for him. He's up on a hill, he's looking down at the harbor. It's characterized by flood and tide. And they made a wonderful s uh, sculpture. It's uh, the mother of the sea, a mythical figure that holds all the creatures in the sea. And uh, she only lets them loose. By, by willpower, and sometimes she withholds them. The shaman has to go down and comb her hair. And she now is sometimes not seen when it's flood, and when it's tide, she rises again mm -hmm. over the surface. So Hans Eger, can see his, uh, his own <laughs> wording, but it's also, of course, something that consciously uh, symbolizes the return of indigenous tradition. And uh, at the same year, as she came there, there was also a big repatriation in a museum, local museum close by. So I thought that was one interesting example of how statues and monuments are not uh, only making things durable and stable, but it's also they are interplaying with each other. They are opening up different relations and they are in dialogue. Here's another one. Uh, some of you might recognize it because one of them is in Stockholm in front of the Museum of Ethnography. Uh, it's a totem pole, a gift from the First Nation uh, of Canada, the Heisla people. It was a gift in exchange when they received as a repatriation uh, the old Gapskolox pole that had been in Sweden then since the 1920s. Also a very controversial repatriation issue. Uh, I traveled uh, to British Columbia together with the former museum director, Anders Björklund, because we had heard that the pole, not as intended originally, were kept as a heritage for the future generations. It had been reclaimed by the late Gaps Golox chief, and uh, he, had, he had decided that it was going to be taken to uh, a very a place few people can visit in, in the forest, an old funerary site for his people. And there it's still lying, and it has returned into its first function as a mortuary pole. People claimed there that it was never an object, it was never intended for preservation. It was a ritual process that had been interrupted mm -hmm. and it's now going on again. Not to spend too many minutes, I will only conclude that I think the monument in Stockholm has a particular role also because it, um, it reminds us of this relation. It also reminds of the complexity of repatriation, which I know that it's been an issue that Tiffany has discussed a lot and brought to this meeting, but also on the fact that it can be revitalizing and confusing in interesting ways. So I'll move on. Another example of the ritual, uh, the ceremonial ways in which people uh, celebrate the drastic turning points in the social biography of objects that repatriations are. Also Museum of Ethnography, a smoke ceremony. <laughs> it was uh, characterized by improvisation. A class visiting the museum at the day of a repatriation were invited to walk through a cleansing smoke by the leader of a uh, Aboriginal delegation from Australia. And this is another example of how you can share heritage in a very concrete way. 
by interpreting photographic collections together. This is from the Swedish missionary field in the Congos. Mm. I'll give the word to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, gosh, I've got so many things I want to say. I want to start by saying I think mm. objects are important. Um, they can locate ideas. Um, so if you think of a concept like nationalism or identity, um, these are concepts that can be bandied about, but in a, in a totem pole or mm -hmm. even um, in another type of object, they can kind of help locate it, which is one reason why you often get conflicts that are over mm. objects or um, human remains, which is another thing I look at. Um, but I don't think they're as important to belonging as is made out. I think um, we're giving too much agency and causality to objects in our discussion, and that belonging is something that is created in society through institutions and through people and through arguments. When, um, so that's kind of the argument I want to make, but I want to use a few examples to try and make it, um, teasing out what objects can do mm. and, and how, we get, how we best use objects, but don't ask too much of Oops. them. Um, I immediately thought of ISIS, an Islamic state or whatever, we're meant mm. to call them, and their attempt to destroy Palmyra. There was a really big debate in mm. Britain when there was an outraged response to this, where people said, aren't you caring more about objects than people? After all, lots of people are dying, and suddenly you're concerned about these ancient, ancient objects. I think that was a false counter position. Um, I think those, the Palmyra arch, um, is a number of things, one of which it is it's an example how, of how human beings always go beyond necessity to create things that will outlast them, that aren't immediately useful, um, but are perhaps inspiring and beautiful. And knowing how old that is, and the thousands of people that have passed through Palmyra, is in some ways in a in a time where things seem so transitory and temporary and digital, it's kind of a kind of locator and a sense of permanence and important. Um, so that that they are important, um, but I've been really concerned with the way in which um, objects are being asked to do things that I think they cannot do. And I think the prime example of that in the heritage sector is the debates over repatriation. Um, I think the debates over repatriation bring out the worst um, in all sorts of players and politics. So the idea that one person or one culture owns something, and you can see this in demands from Turkey, from Greece, and one of the arguments put forward is that it has a kind of essentialist relationship to that culture, so it's Greek or it's Turkish. Um, I think you can see this in the claims for things like the totem mm -hmm. poles. I mean, who owns that and why? It's certainly not, in, in, my, in my point of view, on the basis of blood, on the basis of who has been born into a community. Um, I think it can be really divisive to have these conflicts over ownership on the basis of identity. Um, and you do have a number of situations now where only certain communities can speak about objects. And I make a distinction between objects that are in the community, you know, churches, um, religious practices, religious groups, uh, individuals, they have objects that are in their home or, or used in the community. That, they haven't left that. But once they do leave that, and particularly once they become a museum object, I think they take on a different life and a different meaning. They are no longer objects of ritual, and I don't actually think you can return them. I think you kinda, they, have, they keep on going, and they remain. In a kind of, in a museum, they're almost like in an elevated context. Uh, they become something to, they might be a social text to be read. They might be an object of beauty, but they are no longer an object of use. And I think the kind of, the repatriation thing is a really symbolic thing to kind of return it away from uh, the museum out of something that we can all look at and appreciate and try and understand and get to grips with and put it back to the community. But I don't think it's actually possible to do so. 
there are lots of debates over this um, in Britain with a group of pagans and um, over some objects and some human remains. And one thing that was really interesting to me was that you had one group called Pagans for Archaeology, who want to see things on display, and then you have the another group, which is honouring the ancient dead, and they wanted things to come off display. As it happens, there were more people in Pagans for Archaeology than they were in honouring the dead. So in terms of, you know, on what basis do you have authority? In terms of numbers, Pagans for Archaeology had it. Um, honouring the ancient dead was about three people. And maybe a dog. Um, but who did, who got the authority to decide? Honouring the ancient dead, because they were saying the right thing. And I think there's, you know, when, when, when we talk about who decides and which groups have authority, it's often the ones that are saying what certain professionals want them to hear. And they don't necessarily speak for the community. Um, sometimes they are the most backward. Sometimes they are, you know. Um, what about those in that tribe, for example, who might not want things back? They're very rarely heard. Um, I think it's quite a kind of suspicious process, and one that can, in uh, negative ways, change the meaning of objects. Now, objects mean all sorts of things, and it's entirely open to everybody to discuss what they have meant, but I want to leave you with an example, and like all examples, it's extreme, and there are probably many examples mm -hmm. of something entirely different happening. But this is a case of um, a couple of bark etchings uh, that are owned by the British Museum, which does, has to be said, own quite a lot of things. Um, they were, they're from Australia, from Northern Australia. They were made in the 1860s, and they're really interesting because whereas a lot of Aboriginal art was uh, temporary, and maybe on the ground. These were paintings and etchings on tree barks, and they're portable. Uh, and they look more like kind of paintings that you'd hang on the wall. They were bought, they were made in 1860 or so, and bought by a Scottish settler called Jim Kerr uh, for what appears to be a kind of intermediary art ex exhibition. So Aboriginal artists, making things for the new people. Uh, and you have that sort of a similar thing happening in Peru with shrunken heads, except rather than using real heads, uh, they very sensibly used monkey's head and sold them all to the colonial traders who are suddenly curious, with these, curious about these things. So there's a kind of, you know, there's an engagement there. British Museum acquires it in the end um, entirely legitimately, but now a certain tribe wants them back. And when I say back, they never had them. But there's this notion that they are suddenly more authentically theirs than perhaps the museums or Jim, who bought them originally from the painter. Uh, who that painter is, we, we don't know. Such is the kind of whim of history. Many people are forgotten, and only what becomes important about what we want to know happens later. One of the big disagreements is over how they were acquired. Um, as I said, entirely legitimately bought, probably made for him and for people like him to buy. Uh, but now, because of the kind of certain political pressures and the way in which we see the past, it is not conceivable in activists' mind that that could have happened. And it is, uh, there is only one interpretation allowed, which is it's theirs. Uh, it was illegitimately acquired and it has to be returned to make them feel more Aboriginal, more like kind of um, a particular community uh, determined very much by its past. I think that's rewriting history and it's rewriting history in a way that demeans those people who painted and sold those objects. Um, I think it's obscuring what those objects actually mean. And it's not going to achieve the sense of belonging that people say it's going to. The kind of uh, the demands that are being placed on, on museums to return things is very divisive. It's, it is ours. You can't understand it. It can't possibly be a museum piece. Now, museums can do all sorts, sorts of things, but they can't kind of create belonging. They can't 
if you think about Aboriginals in Australia, their average life expectancy is 40. It's much lower than white people's. So there's a very serious problem there that's not going to be resolved by returning these barks. But I think the whole politics um, means that rather than kind of working together to try and achieve it in the real world, objects are being asked to do things uh, which, which they cannot possibly do. So for belonging, we have to, A, not be quite so kind of uh, hostile and talk about our differences. We need to talk about things that we share in common and not ask too much of museums to do things they just can't do. Thank you. Then, then um, uh, I, I want to um, uh, tell another story uh, of a similar uh, problem that I think we can draw some different conclusions from. Uh, in, in 2005, in connection with the celebration of the 100th uh, uh, anniversary of the separation between Sweden and Norway, uh, Nordiska Museet mm -hmm. uh, donated a huge amount, a very valuable uh, collection of uh, uh, Iron Age uh, artifacts, Viking artifacts, uh, bronzes, swords, um, sort of back to Norway. Uh, in the official uh, sort of description of this event, it was described in very sort of almost colloquial, very peaceful terms, saying that um, the great Arthur Hazelius, who made these collections, uh, he had a keen eye for the value, uh, the, the value of these objects. He gathered them, and now as a celebration of the, um, uh, the close proximity between these people, they are now being returned to the Oslo National Museum which is on one level a very true story, but there is another underlying story which makes, I think, this example even more important for us when we think about these issues. Uh, because uh, when Arthur Hasselius started uh, his uh, great project to create the Nordisk Museet and Skansen, being a pioneer, as we all know, I mean, the world-leading pioneer when it comes to creating these kind of, of uh, institutions, uh, he was animated by a very, very clear, uh, both social and political and cultural agenda. Uh, he was a Nordist, he was a Scandinavist, but he was also a, a fervent reader of Almqvist. He was, very pre he was very preoccupied with the social differences in the society between the sort of upper class and the poor peasants. Also, this was right after the huge emigration waves. He wanted sort of to, com to unite Sweden under a new kind of sort of cultural contract. And the idea was to sort of put, uh, address the attention towards these, in a sense, trivial peasant artifacts, old clothing, uh, uh, little pots and pans and things that he sent out people to collect, including older artifacts. So this was a huge cultural political endeavor. The later generation of, of, of people at Nordiska Museet sort of transformed it into a more sort of scientific uh, project, but the originally animating idea behind this was to create a, a national monument, but not in a nationalistic way. It was Scandinavian, it was Nordic, and it was the idea of sort of creating a kind of union between the classes. But what became interesting uh, as a kind of conflict within this project was precisely the idea of, of Nordism. Because for, for Hasselius, Norway and Sweden were brother people and they were united under one king. But of course, the Norwegian nationalism was starting up at the same point. So already in the 80s, some of the Norwegian nationalists were questioning this, this, this praxis, saying, why are you gathering our artifacts? We want to build a nation too. So Arthur Hasselius, in all his idealism, came into conflict with this. But he managed to create the Nordiska Museet. But... Uh, but this, of course, this situation, which was always about both nationalism, politics, and about artifacts mm -hmm. and the role of museums in nation building, uh, you can say in a sense culminated in the very sort of decisive debate around what to do with the Norway issue. And in, in, in 1905, as we know, there were many people, strong opinion, especially among the upper class and the military, who wanted to keep Norway. And they were prepared to do it with military means, just the same way as the British were prepared to keep Ireland. But the fact was that the slight majority decided to let Norway go. And this is very, very important for modern Swedish history. So in that sense, they broke the Scandinavian contract, but in the name of a sense of brotherhood. And in that sense, Sweden avoided 
1916 arisal that we are celebrating or commemorating today, where the British refusal to address Irish nationalism led to the disaster of the 1916 uh, uh, sort of failed revolution and the very, very bloody uh, uh, sort of uh, repression of this. This was the British solution to the Irish question, whereas the Swedish solution to the Norway question was precisely the opposite, with a small majority. And in that sense, I think that the 2005 gift, which at this point was so trivial that nobody even thought about it, mm. I think has a very significant um, symbolic importance for how you deal with these issues. And you cannot simply say that it's an easy matter where objects belong, because this was precisely what was at the core of it. And the Norwegians received this gift. They said, oh, Haselius was a great man. He collected these things. We're happy to take them back. But of course, you have a history. And the decisions that people made in the course of this history was very, very important for the peaceful solution of this part of Europe, as opposed to the relation between the British and the Irish. So now mm. we can discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. Oh, one, one, one thought just to this Norwegian and to allow you a moment to think <laughs> uh, is, of course, uh, whether what, what happens to the, to the frame of a museum when, when uh, collections, when whole entire collections move out. Mm. Uh, I mean, museums also create categories such as the Nordic or the Swedish, or the Norwegian, or the ethnographic, mm. for that case. And of course you could, on a, on a critical line, you could say, what, what strange purification of the Swedish is this? Mm. Shouldn't the, isn't this part of the Swedish history? I mean, should we really sort of cut away? It's a kind of um, uh, politics of forgetfulness, in a way, also. You mean in giving it away? Yeah, you could. I mean, I'm just raising it. As yeah, no, I, mean, I, don't think that, I don't think the Norwegians would have, have uh, sort of taken to weapons to get back this collection. Uh, you might but, want to have but, a... But, uh, but it's, a, it's uh, a recognition, I think, of two things. It's a recognition of a long political alliance and the peaceful solution uh, to a potentially very dangerous situation. And it's also a recognition of the importance of artifacts. You give them back, and it's a gift. I think a little bit like this gift. And oh, okay. I look upon Nordiska Museet in a way is a museum of a museum already. I mean, if you go there, it's a kind mm. of institution in an institution, right? Mm. You look at this sort of Egyptian uh, pharaohic Gustav mm. Vasa and all the artifacts. It's a very strange museum, but mm. completely fascinating. But, but, but in a sense, the lacuna in the collection mm -hmm. is a monument also. I think the lacuna is part of the collection. It's a kind of the fact that these objects moved away, just like your mm -hmm. totem pole, mm -hmm. in a sense, marks also an historical event, which means that the restoration has, mm -hmm. uh, I think, historical significance, no? I think, actually, that all of these major movements and turning points are possible to... I, I, I think it's interesting to look at them like this. What, when things move, mm -hmm. something else is also... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, unstable or under negotiation. And Absolutely. I think it's not only a matter of who owns the things. I think it's very much an ontological question. Mm. What are the things? Mm. Is, is the state you're talking about as the museum object is something closed, preserved, now belonging to everybody, but kept in the centers, in the museums in Europe, for instance? Uh, or is, is that necessarily, I mean, we, it's, it's a very strong claim to say that any status is eternal. I mean, but you could also that. say maybe it wasn't, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a dead person whom we should mourn or... I mean, I'm not, I'm a museum person myself. I don't think it's like either or, but I think it's a very interesting situation when we allow ourselves to be, and our own interpretations to be destabilized and decentered. It opens for new knowledge. Critical thinking is very important, but one of the mm. interesting things today is that um, everybody's putting everything down. Um, in academia, it, you always ha the outsider position is the insider position, which makes it very unstable. Um, there is a problem of belonging. I think whatever country you're in, there's a problem of what, what do we have in common, what do we value. I mean, you cannot say you're British today without feeling a bit odd and a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and we've just seen in the States, you know, a clearly very divided country where people don't speak to each other. Um, who hold different opinions. Um, 
and I think there's probably very similar things playing out in the whole of Europe. And it concerns me greatly that museums and objects are being asked to play a role in this. At the same time, as we're mm -hmm. saying, we have to destabilize everything. So number one, I don't think, I mean, I look at museums, so I say museums, but I, th I know that the rest of the kind of cultural world is being asked to play a role. Um, on the one hand, they're being asked to do things they cannot do. You will not um, help Native American communities by returning bones that are hundreds or a thousand years old, nor sacred objects. Right? It just will not But how, how, do, you, not how do you know this categorically? Because this is, I mean, I, I think we agree on the general mm -hmm. um, um, sort of premise that we should not sort of uh, fetishize objects um, um, to a, a greater extent than necessary. I mean, objects have importance for us. We cannot neglect the importance of objects, but we should try to avoid sort of, uh, them becoming fetishes that sort of drive mm. historical processes. This, I think, is also the intellectual, mm. um, um, it's part of sort of just uh, good intellectual standard. But at the same time, how can you categorically say in all cases that it's of no importance to return things? I mean, if you really bring it down to the critical cases where there is an obvious case of theft, where you simply have to readjust it, I mean, the kind of things that were sort of stolen and taken during Nazi occupation, for example, where mm -hmm. there's a clear, not, not always a clear case of, of a juridical uh, solution, but at least you can sort of make it into processes. It's more difficult, and it becomes, of course, at one point absurd when you're dealing with things that are sort of millennia away. And there I agree the with you, but, 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 but what, what I react to in, in your argument is sort of the categorical claim that you oh, know okay. that these objects cannot be... How can you know this? I know, I'm telling you what I think, yeah, and I think, I think that's a really positive thing, because that way you know what I think. And I think most of us do think things, but we pretend we don't, okay? <laughs> there are many arguments being made through the disguise of how do you know, uh, but we're all presenting arguments. The thing is, I think you disagree, and rather than saying that, you say, how do you know? Um, how do I know? Well, I'm, my argument is, when I look at the conflicts over repatriation, I think there are a number of interesting and concerning dynamics which lead me to the conclusions I've reached. Now, it's entirely possible that there are instances that it's all, everybody's happy and it's great and it doesn't, you know, that's fine. But I'm interested in why it's happening now. Uh, it was not the case uh, that it was called for 50, 60 years ago in the way that it is now. More groups and individuals are now claiming it. And I think you've had a number of things. I think you've had the rise of, and some of this is a kind of commentary on politics rather than what's happening in culture. So you've had the rise of, uh, previously, for example, in the States, before demands for cultural heritage were returned, there were demands over land rights and pl for political equality. You had like the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and you had kind of, the idea that we are all equal, we all deserve good treatment, good living conditions. These, I think, are progressive demands for about equality and material provision. And I think in the 70s, you have a kind of uh, more particularist identity movement happening. So people started talking about not how, we're all this, how we've got things in common and we need more. Uh, they started talking about difference and essentialism. And rather than fighting for kind of things in the present, started fighting for things over what happened in the past. So I think that's a kind of a regressive move for anybody that's interested in social but, 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 change. But, but, yeah, okay. Also, mm. oh, sorry, I know I might go on a bit too much. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but also, it's not just something that's happening out with the institution. So one of the really interesting things about mm. uh, what happened in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and America is that there are many people within the academic world, archaeology, anthropology, influenced by theories of post-structuralism, that were as kind of at the vanguard of this. So it's not just like, you know, mm -hmm. white old museum directors refusing to hand things back. You have many cases where they're trying to hand things back and Native American communities, for example, aren't as interested. No, no. You know? mm -hmm. So there's right. a kind of, you know, mm. but so but that makes me worried. But I, but I think I agree a little with this um, gut, the philosopher's uh, gut reaction against <laughs> making <laughs> a very sort of generalized categorical statement because I think you have some very good points on, uh, for instance, on the bark paintings. On if, if you take each repatriation claim seriously, 
it will bring up knowledge to the surface. And sometimes it will be knowledge of, mm -hmm. of, of other agency, other stories. And, and you might say the, the best thing is that we keep this and tell this story together. And, and uh, so I'm, I, I hate to be sort of forced into this sort of polarized mm. eye I'm all for re repatriation. But I do think that it's a, it's a very problematic claim to, uh, uh, to say that we know from some, there's a position from which you can say that objects can do this and not that, they have this meaning and not that. I think we, live, we are beyond that point. We already have to accept that we have a lot of plural uh, understandings of things, of objects and the world and the relations. And uh, I think museums should embrace uh, the possibility to, to play a role in, in discussing that, being aware that identities are work in progress and people reach backwards to move forward in many ways. I mean, they, they take maybe uh, ideas of identities created by museums and use them because that's how they get agency today. What do you think? Mm. It well, might be problematic, uh, yeah. but it might also be something you have to mm. see. Yeah, I mean, people, people who are forced to engage in this, people who are really sort of in the museum sector, I think need uh, also the, the intellectual guidance that, guidance that you need is not to have a general scheme and saying all of these claims are ridiculous, we know what to do, because the thing is they are situation by situation decisions that you have to make. In certain cases, the wise choice is simply to begin the negotiation. In other cases, it's absurd, and you have to analyze also where is this claim coming from. That, I think, is the only reasonable choice. And it's not true that it's only happening now, but I mean, most of, the, most of the examples that you use, and that is also what, to me, is problematic in your book, even though I think it's brilliant in many ways, is that they tend always to be from this post-colonial situation. So it's always these people who are rising and, in a sense, sort of wanting to become nations themselves. And to us, this is a source of embarrassment, because we have this. We know this from the 19th century. And then we see sort of Eskimos and Sama and Aborigines and Indians, and they are playing the nationalist game, right? It looks a little bit ridiculous because we know the story. They invent flags for themselves and things like that. But, I mean, simply saying that for this reason, they are out of pace. I think is being also unhistorical because they are in the move in a process which you simply have to sit down and negotiate and talk about. Why is this happening now? It's not only retrograde, but it has to do with political transformations that we cannot avoid to address because we are living in a post-colonial situation. We are, the world is being negotiated and in certain cases the, the position of objects become important, and you cannot deny that. And if you look at the, the longer perspective, I mean, the whole, the whole uh, juridical discussion about sort of cultural heritage rights, as you know, this was not the, the conflict after the Napoleonic Wars. It was the Vatican who started this discussion because they wanted back their treasures mm -hmm. from Napoleon, who wanted to have them in France. And they managed to create the kind of rudimentary uh, uh, general uh, legislation for this. This is as, as old as this story is. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cut off our heads. <laughs> I, I, the, I, I play the Swede. Uh, no, we shouldn't disagree. <laughs> Let's end this discussion. <laughs> uh, a fantastic discussion. I hope it's it's been very fruitful. Uh, I, I, just just give them a great hand. <laughs> he was about to rip us. <laughs> yeah. I, this was uh, something extra <laughs> uh, to listening to. This is just like, would you like another one? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Tack så hemskt mycket. Vi är lite, vi har dat över lite och nästa programpunkt börjar redan om fem minuter, så att ni hinner liksom upp och vända på er, men lämna inte salen om ni tänker sitta kvar och, och lyssna. Uh, då ska vi prata om. Uh, arvet efter de stora inventeringarna. <laughs>